In the entirety of the book of Galatians, the writer is the Apostle Paul. Many of you know who the Apostle Paul is. Many of you probably read the other epistles written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul uh, was uh, known to be the author of majority of the New Testament books. Like Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And one of the earliest writings that he had was the book that was written to the believers scattered in the region of Galatia. Galatia, uh, we may not know of it today, that exists today, but it used to be in where is modern day West Turkey at this current time. And so there are believers here in the first century church, new believers that just received Christ as their Lord and Savior, that were scattered abroad all throughout this region in modern day West Turkey. Now, along this region, the Apostle Paul and his team would travel in their missionary journey to plant several churches in this region. They would plant several churches in this region of Galatia. And now, after he planted these churches, after about maybe a several months to several years, he would follow up with them and see how they are doing when it comes to their faith. And he would write a letter entitled Galatians amongst all the believers there to see and to encourage the believers there. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. And many times the apostle Paul had to introduce himself. He had to assert the authority of the apostleship given to him, not by man, not by church, but by the Lord Jesus Christ to write unto the churches here. He's addressing the believers scattered abroad in this region in Galatia because there was great trouble in this early church. There was great trouble and difficulty with the new churches, new churches that were started amongst this region. They used to attain uh, to a religion of rules in Judaism until they came across Jesus Christ, which was Christianity, which was the fulfillment of the law in Christ. You know, as we think about what's going on here, what was the problem that was taking place? What was the schism that was taking place in the early church? What was the issue that the Apostle Paul had to first address? And really, in modern terminology, we would call this legalism. It was legalism. They had to address this issue of legalism. And what that basically is summarized as is, we as Christians today at GCC, we believe that faith is by Christ alone. The reason why we are Christian is because we simply placed our faith in Jesus Christ. It is only by faith that we are able to attain eternal life in a place called heaven. That's what we as a church believe in. That's what we believe is to be the fundamental tenet of what is called Christianity. It is simply by faith. But this early church, a lot of these believers, no one ever really told them. This was brand new. This was to them a new concept in many ways. And so for them, they had no idea what it meant about what Christianity is all about. To them, they were used to a religion that had all these rules, as we talked about several weeks ago, uh, weeks ago several rules that they had to follow. If you follow this rule, if you follow this rule, and plus have faith in God, then you will be able to go to heaven. That was what they were accustomed to. That was what they were familiar with. They believed that if you, if you wanted to enter into a place called heaven, if you want to achieve hope, if you want to have eternal life, you must not only believe in God, but you also must follow this commandment, this commandment, and this commandment, especially the issue of circumcision. And so this was an issue that was taking place in this church. Amongst the churches here in the Galatia region, a lot of these churches were under this context of what we would call as the false gospel of legalism. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 9, it says, As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. And so he was addressing here the Jewish Christians here that somewhat fell into the trap and the deceit that you had to obey certain rules and have faith in Christ in order for you to be saved. You had to obey the Mosaic Old Testament laws plus your faith in Christ in order to be saved. But Paul was trying to address to them, that is not the gospel. That is not what Christianity is all about. That is not why Jesus came to this world. Jesus didn't come here to add unto the law. Jesus didn't come here to add to works. He came to fulfill the law. He came to abolish the law. He came to get rid of the works so that we as individuals who are unable to be perfect, 
unable to achieve that pure righteousness, we simply need to simply believe in Jesus Christ in order for us to attain eternal life. It's not by our works, not by our might, but by our faith in Christ alone. And so Paul was addressing this matter because this church is here uh, were trying to mix two religions into one. In Galatians chapter 3, 11, it says, Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith alone. And Paul describes the summary of the law's purpose in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It says, So the law was a guardian until Christ came that we may be justified, not by works, but by what? Faith. And so that was what Paul was trying to address here. Paul was saying, we are no longer under the law. We are no longer under by works. We are justified simply by faith alone. It is not a work-based salvation. And he's trying to address this matter. He addresses this matter to the churches here, reminding them the gospel that your church has started is under the gospel that we believe that, uh, that uh, eternity is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And that was what he was reminding them of what to do. But now we come in chapter 6. After he addresses this doctrinal issue of legalism, after he addresses this false gospel, now the believers here understand what the gospel means. They understand, oh, as Paul mentioned, it is not by faith plus works. It's simply by faith alone. You can follow whatever rules as much as possible, that, but that doesn't mean anything. It is simply by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And now Paul turns to chapter here in chapter 6 after he talks about what the fruits of the flesh are and what are the fruits of spirits. And now he talks about what are the practical ways of how we ought to live, especially as new believers. You are all new believers here. In the region here, you are all new Christians. You've only been a Christian for several months, for some of you several weeks, for some of you several maybe one or two years. That's it. You are brand new Christians. How ought you to live how should you live in your christian life and this was the early church and he was trying to teach them the practical application of how christians ought to live accordingly because now they are no longer under the law but under grace how they ought to treat one another and after three main chapters he now turns the gospel of how under the gospel we could have a righteous christian life so how do we come together when it comes to that well, Paul's main point that he's trying to address in chapter 6 is really in order for us to grow practically as a Christian, we need to support one another. You can't grow by yourself, he's saying. You can't grow in this newfound religion, newfound faith by yourself. You need one another. You need one another to support you. You need to support the others as well. And so the context and the entire chapter here, chapter 6, he's, the main point that he's trying to get across is you must do good, not only to all, but especially to the believers which are in the household of faith, to the brothers and sisters in the church. And for our church, if we're to grow together, we must do good, not only in our community, but also most especially within our household of faith, which is the church. And how do we come together in support for one another? Paul gives four main instructions of how we can support one another. First of all, we notice here the instruction to restore. The instruction to restore. In verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6, we notice what the text says here. Brothers and sisters, if anyone, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. And the Apostle Paul is continuing here in chapter 6. In chapter 5, he was talking about what it means to walk in the Spirit. You have the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. These are the wonderful fruits of the Spirit. Now, what do you do with that? Now we come to chapter 6. Remember, in the original manuscript, there were no chapter divides. In chapter 5 to chapter 6, it was a continuation letter that was happening. And so chapter 6 is Paul now addressing here how and what you ought to do with this fruit that you have achieved because you walk in the Spirit. And now he's talking here and addressing those that are walking in the flesh, which is against God, and walking in the Spirit. He here, in here in chapter 6, he addresses those that are more spiritual. He gives them one simple instruction, restore. He gives them one simple instruction, restore one another, especially those that have fallen away, 
and fallen in their spiritual life. And some may have fallen into sin in the early church. This was brand new. And so for them, they were tempted after some time. You know, Christianity is so hard. This is difficult to live for God. I don't want to do this anymore. So they go back to their fleshly desires, go back to the way that they used to live before they met Christ. And so for them, it was easy for them to fall back into that temptation. And some even today, unfortunately, in the modern church have also fallen into sin. Yet I want us to remember this. Those that have fallen into sin... God never forgets them. Once you're saved, you're always saved. We do not believe that you lose your salvation. Once you place your faith in Jesus Christ and he has transformed your life, you cannot lose that gift that God has given you. We make that, we understand that that eternal life is forever. And so now we see here in this church the believers that have fallen away. And likewise, we as a church, there are some that have fallen away in the faith. There are some that have fallen into sin. There are some even right now that are tempted to fall away into sin. So what do we do with those believers in the church? Do we judge them? Do we push them aside? Do we scorn them away? No. Paul says in Galatians, one simple command. Restore unto them with a spirit of meekness and humility. The word restore means to mend together, to repair, to complete. It means to bring back. And that's what we ought to do as a church. Because a church is a place where people come. No matter how broken they are, no matter how fallen away they are, they come to be restored, not by man, but by Jesus Christ amongst the believers that are gathering and worshiping him here. You know, I think about a story of two friends that went into a car dealership to get one of their cars repaired at the service department. They were waiting in the lobby in this car dealership, like the ones right here on Hawthorne Boulevard. And as they were waiting, they were just talking about church and faith. And one of them turned to the other friend and said simply to the other friend, I don't think I need to go to church because I feel like a hypocrite. I don't really believe. I don't live for Christ. And I continue to live in sin. And the other friend replied, hmm, that's interesting. What do you call the area that we are sitting in right now? And he says, the friend says, the showroom. And then the other friend pointed out to the section behind the lobby, behind the receptionist's desk, where the friend's car was at. And he asked the friend, what do you call that section? And the friend replied, the service department. And the other friend replied, what if I told you I didn't want to bring my car to get repaired because it was failing to work properly? And the friend replied, well, that's foolish. Why would you not bring your car to the service department if it's broken? If something's wrong with your car, you don't know how to clearly fix it sometimes. So why are you going to come to the, uh, why are you not going to bring your vehicle back to the service department? That would be a foolish thing to do. The other friend asked, why would you not bring that car to the showroom? And the friend says, that is for showing off nice cars, not to repair them. And the other friend replied, perhaps you need to remember that church is not a showroom, but it's a service department where you are repaired. And likewise, we need to remember what the purpose of the church is. The church is not where believers come to show off their faith. Oh, look at me. I'm spiritual. I'm singing so so loud with my tone-deaf voice. That's me only, okay? This is not a place where we come to show off our spirituality. It's not a place, a community where we show off how much we make, how smart or intellectual we are. It's not a place of showing off. But the church is like a service department at a car dealership. It's like a hospital when the sick... When those that are broken, when those that need a repair, they come and they find hope again. They find restoration because brothers and sisters are willing to love them and to bring them back, not just to be a part of a social club, but to bring them back to the hope that founded them first, which is through Jesus Christ. And we must remember that is what the church is. Within our church, we must recognize that the church is not a place to be like a show-off area of our spirituality, but it's a place to get mended, to get restored through the cross. 
In 2 Thessalonians, Paul addresses this matter. He says, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them. Warn them as you would a fellow believer. And so for those, obviously, that have fallen away, there are going to be those that do not want to come back. And you could do your best to try to bring them back. You could try your best to pray for them. And you could do your best to even confront them. But at times, they're not going to come back. But what Paul is saying, still do not count them as an enemy. They're still your brother and sister in Christ. Therefore, continue to warn them. And that's what we ought to do as a church today. What was going on along in the Thessalonica church? There was sin of laziness. There was sin of idleness and disorderliness taking place. And Paul says, we're not idle. We could have been lazy. We, we could have been lazy. We could have done nothing. But we chose to work. We chose to be busy by to be an example to you. And likewise, you as Christians, if someone is idle, if someone is not working, admonish them. Call them out for the purpose of restoring them. Some that were in sin, you must do so to bring them back, back to the restoration. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Do not do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own self-interest, but each of you to the interests of others. And look, there are some that have fallen into sin, not walking in the spirit, not walking, um, walking in the flesh, but you that are spiritual, what Paul is saying here, you that are spiritual, you that are currently walking in the Spirit, you that are faithfully serving, faithfully being part of a church, faithfully attending house church, all of that, do not judge them. Do not have a condescending attitude towards, that, towards them that have fallen away. Do not have a spirit of haughtiness toward them. Do not have a spirit of pride against them. Do not have a condescending attitude towards them, but bring them back as they may reignite their fellowship with the Lord. And many people have left church not because of the world, but many people have left church because of Christians in the church. They were hurt because somebody gossiped about them. They were hurt because they had a condescending attitude towards them because they were not meeting a criteria. When you come to GCC Canvas, there's no criteria meter we have that goes like, dee, 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 dee. You know, we don't have that. You come in the way you are, and we will love you. You come in with your brokenness and your sins and all that and temptation, and we will love you. And by the way, brothers and sisters, that's what we ought to do with our fellow brothers and sisters in this congregation as well. Perhaps there's somebody that comes back that hasn't been to church in 10 years. You know why they didn't come back. They fell into sin. They did something bad. And the moment they enter through those double doors or that door or that door, I want us to remember what Paul has commanded us to welcome back with the spirit of restoration. Don't judge them. Don't be condescending towards them. That is not our command to do. We are commanded to restore that brother in love. That's what Jesus did for us. We came to Jesus broken, didn't we? We came to Christ with our sin and our wretchedness and our wickedness. And Christ didn't say, you didn't meet the criteria. Christ said, I love you so much. Above anything else, you come to me with all your heavy burdens and heavy uh, worries and anxiety and all of that. Come to me and I'll bring it all and I'll heal you and I'll bring you restoration. That's what Christ did. And likewise, we ought to do that as well. But notice here not only the instruction to re, uh, restore, but secondly, the instruction to reinforce. After Paul tells the churches in Galatia to restore the fallen brothers, he says here to reinforce them. Reinforce not only the fallen, but also one another. And then reinforce yourself. In verse 2, it says, carry each other's burden, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. What are we supposed to reinforce? It says carry each other's what? Burdens. And the word burden really means heaviness. It's something so difficult that the person cannot carry it by themselves. That specific word in the Greek language is talking about something that's so heavy, so burdensome, so worrisome that the person individually cannot carry it. Therefore, Paul is saying, 
those of you in the church carry each other's burdens. Help the one that's struggling. Help the one that's a little finding it difficult to grow in his spiritual life or her spiritual life. Help the one that's going through depression. Help the one that's going through anxiety. Help the one that's going through trials or maybe something wrong with their family or their marriage. Help them. That is what Paul is saying. Carry each other's burden. Remember that the fallen away we must restore, but we must also consider one another that we may fall into temptation. Because any of us could fall into the same temptation that those that have fallen away have, have done so. We try to restore those that have fallen away into sin, but likewise we must remember we cannot deceive ourselves. We too can fall away too. We could decline in our spiritual strength. We could no longer be faithful to church. We could all of a sudden fall into sin. And likewise, in order for us to not to fall into that temptation, the Bible says we must carry each other's load, burden, the heaviness. You know, I remember when I was 15 years old, I was a very prideful teenager. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is get stronger at that age. Um, and we, I went to LA Fitness, where is, which is now some uh, book, book sale shop on, on um, next to Hometown Buffet, which also doesn't exist, next to whatever store that's over there right now in that mall section, uh, there was an LA Fitness there. Obviously, it now moved towards the Harbor City, but there was an LA Fitness there in the mall section, and I remember going there, and one of my favorite machines, and really the only machine I went on, was the bench press, and the bench press was one of those bar uh, benches that you lie down on, and you have a bar, and then you lift that up. And on top of that bar, you would have these latches that would hold on to the bar. I mean, you had to put it up on the bar, so or put it on the latches so that it would not fall on you. That's the whole purpose of those latches. And I remember just, you know, being a young, prideful teenager. I was part of the wrestling team at Torrance High, and I said, I can lift as heavy as I want. And uh, I saw, you know, a bunch of other people, so I went to show off. And then I put on one weight, and I put on another weight, and I continuously put on other weights, and I start to lift. And, you know, one, it was okay. I was able to do it. Two, I was able to do it. Three, I was able to do it. Four, I was able to do it. And then five, I began to struggle a little bit. Now, I was so prideful, I decided to do this by myself. Normally, and for safety reasons, you're supposed to have a spotter, somebody that's able to watch your weight to make sure that you don't drop it. But I didn't need that. I was 15. I said, I'm good. And, uh, you know, I was just lying down on the bench and now struggling, and I exerted all my energy, and I was like, Aah! and I lifted it up, and then I, you know, when you're, when you're struggling so much, you just want it gone, right? You just want to put on the latch and done. And uh, I felt the latch, and I put it on, but what I didn't know is the latch only catched on one side, and the other side, it didn't catch. And so immediately, I was done struggling, and I let go of the entire bar as, as soon as I felt like it latched. And the right side of the bar, with the weights, fell on my forehead. And fell like this, and then all the weights came down. And then all of a sudden, as I tried to get up, all the weights flipped on the other side. And it fell. And you know, I had a big four mark right here, or, or a scar right here. It was red <laughs> on my forehead. And it was embarrassing. And I looked around, and all the grandmas were working out at the time. And one of the grandmas came up, are you OK? You know, you need a spotter. You want me to spot you? I'm like, no, 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 it's OK. <laughs> I thought I could do it myself. But isn't that sometimes many of us in our spiritual life? Oh, I, I'm fine, Pastor. I could walk spiritually by myself. I'm fine. I have Christ in me. That's it. I can continue to be faithful on my own. I don't need to be accountable. I don't need to be vulnerable. I don't need to share what I'm struggling with at my house church. I don't need to be a part of a fellowship. That's the, I don't need that. I, I'm an introvert. Extrovert, introvert, it doesn't matter. You can't handle it by yourself. We can't handle it. I know I'll be the first to say I can't handle it by myself. And we all know this. There are some struggles that are just too difficult to bear. And that's why we need each other. That's why we need to be there for one another. That's why we must look. When you come to church today, when you come to church every day, we must look at our fellow brothers and sisters. 
We cannot just go to our assigned seat by your own measure. You assign it yourself, I know. Okay, you, you can't go to your assigned seat by your own measure and uh, sit by them and just cross your arms and just wait for the countdown five minutes to go down. Hey, look around. That brother is going through something. That sister just had a miscarriage. That mom just had cancer. That dad is just lost a son. Every one of us are going through something. We're all going through something. And sometimes we're able to get through it. Maybe it's something not that difficult physically, emotionally. Yeah, we're able to get through it alone. But there's going to be a time that there's going to be something difficult that comes about. And that's why we need each other to carry each other's load. Why do we do this? The Bible says, carry each other's burdens. In this way, you will what? Fulfill the law of Christ. What does that mean? Fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? The law of Christ is simply what Matthew chapter 22 says. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourselves. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The law is simply this. Love God. Love others. That's what Jesus said. The Pharisees, the religious elite, were asking Jesus, what is the greatest commandment that people ought to follow? And Jesus responded, you need to love God and you need to love others. And how do we love others? By carrying each other's burdens. Being there for that fellow brother. Being there for our fellow sisters. Being there for one another. Because we cannot deceive ourselves. We are not able to get through it by ourselves. This heaviness, this burden, this difficulty, we cannot overcome it. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Pride comes before destruction. The only way that we would destroy ourselves is not by others, but by ourselves, our own pride. And if we are thinking that we are above sin, above the trials, above the temptations, the Bible says in Galatians that we are deceiving ourselves. And that's why we must carry each other's burdens. That's why we see the apostles many times mentioning in the book, and like James, to confess your faults, to confess your sins to one another, to be vulnerable. When you go to house church this Friday, I pray that you would be more open. I pray that you would be more faithfully committed to house church than in your, in your group settings and your fellowship and to church. Not because we just want to eat food, although that's a great part. Some of our house churches make amazing food. But we do it so that we remind ourselves that we are there for one another. Some of the burdens that we share in some of our house churches, I, you know, I think about our house church, there are struggles. There are some difficult things. And we have to remind ourselves that we must be there for one another. And so we see the instruction to reinforce. But thirdly, we see the instruction to reap. Instruction to reap. Not only does Paul say, you know, you must restore those fallen. Restore those that have fallen into sin. But we must also reinforce others so that we may not fall into sin. Help one another. Encourage a brother. Confront a brother or sister. Hey, tell them, hey, this is, this is what I'm saying. I want to be there for you. But thirdly, notice here, we must reap. What do we reap? What do we harvest? Righteousness. Righteousness. The Bible says in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And Paul reminds the Galatian believers here, reap the outcome here. Reap righteousness. Redeem it. He gives a very practical instruction to share unto them that teach you. The teacher or the one that is discipling another is redeeming what they are sowing. It says, and also to not be deceived. As I mentioned, let us not deceive ourselves. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful of all things and beyond cure. Who can know it? We always say, do not lie to yourself, don't we? We must remember that we must not be deceived. And in the previous chapter, chapter uh, 5, Paul talks about the, what happens when you plant the wrong seed. You know, in a harvest season, what reaping is essentially is you're harvesting during the summer. You're putting, I'm sorry, you're putting the uh, seeds in the summer. You're putting it down. You're watering it. You're making sure everything is okay. You're making sure the sunlight's coming onto the plants. And then during harvest season, what do you do? After you sow during the summer, what do you do? You reap. You reap the harvest. 
But if you plant something bad, what happens? You reap something bad. And what Paul is saying is giving a simple analogy here. You reap what you sow. A man reaps what he sows. He says, whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap what? Destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so in the previous chapter, that was chapter 6, but in the uh, previous chapter, chapter 5, we see in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's a long list. If you sow to the flesh, if you sow to the desire to the flesh, it's going to reap what? Corruption. I mean, this is why it says here we do not inherit the kingdom of God because we have sinned. We are raping corruption. And our hearts are corrupt. Therefore, something that is corrupt cannot enter in a place that is holy, which is a place called heaven. But as, so, as much as we sow to please the flesh, we're going to reap all this. You see all these sad things that are taking place. We wonder as to why our marriages are failing. We wonder as to why our kids are no longer uh, focused on the Lord or perhaps living a righteous life. We wonder why we are not being united with our fellow brothers and sisters. We wonder why we're not getting along with our own parents. We wonder why we have this bitterness in our hearts. And we wonder why we have all these anxiety and these bad things that are sowing deep in our heart. Because we are sowing to please the flesh. We are sowing to please ourselves. It's my way or the highway. God, I know you said this. But I want to live the, my life the way I want to live. If it doesn't please me, I don't want that. If it doesn't please my flesh, I don't want that. And we may momentarily have a peaceful and joyful in that momentarily second time. But the Bible makes it clear. You reap what you sow. If that is our life to please our flesh, then we will reap corruption. We will reap all of that. But what's the other side of it? Galatians chapter 5, Paul says in the previous chapter, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. You sow the Spirit that's going to strengthen you. You're going to reap the blessings of the Spirit. Your marriages will get strengthened. Your families will get strengthened. Your family will come back to the Lord. Your, your friends and co-workers will come back to the Lord. All these benefits will come if we sow by walking in the Spirit. We want to get rid of bitterness? It starts with the heart. We want to get rid of uh, anxiety and anger and frustrations? It starts with the heart. How do we do it? Do we get counseling? Yeah, that may help. Do we seek methods of self-help? Yeah, that may help. But the source of it all is walking in the Spirit, which is in Christ. Asking God every day, God, help me to uh, sow in you. God, help me to walk in the Spirit. Help me to walk in you. Help me to walk a righteous life that is uh, uh, giving you all the glory and honor. And guess what? What happens then? We reap the amazing blessings that comes about it. And so we see the instruction to reap. But lastly here, notice here the final instruction that Paul says. Instruction to remain. Remain. He calls upon the church to restore the fallen. He calls unto you to re reinforce one another, to support each other. He calls upon you to reap righteousness, to sow after the Spirit, to live a godly life, and then lastly, he gives a final instruction here in chapter, uh, verse 9 to 10. Remain. Remain. In verse 9 it says, Let us not be weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. 
And he gives instruction here to reap righteousness. And you sow, you reap what you sow. You sow to the flesh, you reap to the flesh. You sow to the Spirit, you reap of the Spirit. And now Paul is addressing those that are sowing to the Spirit. You are about to reap from this. You're going to reap a wonderful harvest one day. So right now as you're sowing, Paul says, do not be wary in doing good. Don't be wary in doing that. Continue to do good for in the proper time, when the time comes, you will reap a harvest of blessings and wonderful things if you do not give up. In Ephesians 5, 5, 15, it says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. When Paul says making the most of every opportunity, he's saying redeem the time. To buy up, to take up, to fill up. And we don't have much opportunity to sow sinful things, to sow to the flesh. But when we are filled with the Spirit, what do we reap? When a church sows to the Spirit, what do we reap? You start to sing spiritual songs to one another. Our praise gets louder. We have a wonderful praise team. Praise the Lord for that. You start to give thanks. You want to start saying thanks to somebody. You sow to the Spirit. You start to pray for one another. You start to love and you start to submit to others. And the greatest truth of what we will reap is that we will reap everlasting life. Paul wrote that truth in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will raise imperishable, and we will be changed. And what a wonderful truth that is, that it may be difficult to try to restore that fallen brother or sister. You might say, it's so hard. You might say, it's so hard. This person in our house church, they're just difficult to get along with. Paul says, do good. Remain doing good. Remain doing good right now. Because you have no idea what you're about to reap. You being good to that difficult person, if you continue to do so, you're going to see the harvest. You're going to see the blessing. That person after one or two years of being so difficult, their life may transform. Because you, by the grace of God, continue to do good. And he or she was able to see that. And you will reap the harvest. What a wonderful truth that is. And it may be difficult to try to overcome and help one another overcome the burden of sin. Yet Paul says to the believers, continue. And do not be wary in doing good. Continue to live an obedient life. Continue to walk in the Spirit. Continue to help one another because one day you will reap the harvest. And what better outcome is there when one day all the burdens, all the difficulties, all the trials, and all the sorrows that we felt one day, all of that, no more tears, it will be gone, and we will be rejoicing in a place called heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I think about when I was a youth pastor back at Hillcrest Baptist. I was a youth pastor in Riverside for nine years before I came to GCC. And I remember during that, my last year there, there was one lady there. She was a faithful single lady uh, in her 50s. And, um, you know, she was part of the church. And I remember one time that she fell from her stairs. And, you know, she had this condition, physical heart condition. It was an enlarged heart. She had an enlarged heart. And she had it ever since she was born. So she always struggled. There was a lot of difficulties that she experienced. And her name's Vanessa. And you can see her here in this picture. And, uh, you know, Vanessa, she fell during Christmas. Out of all the time, it was Christmas in the middle of COVID. And I remember that day because uh, her mom got COVID. So I went to visit the mom at the hospital because no other person were, was able to take her to the hospital. So I just took her to the hospital. And at the time, there was only one person allowed. So I was, I, I was kind of the only one that was able to stay with her. So I stayed with the mom for four hours there at the hospital in uh, Parkside in Riverside. Um, and after that, I was getting out, and it was the day before Christmas. And uh, we had a youth retreat that was coming up later that week, and I had to get ready for that. But uh, after that was ha happened, I get a call, 30 minutes, literally. I'm on the 91 back to Torrance. And I get a call that Vanessa fell, her daughter fell at the stairs on the, from the second floor. And she broke her hip. 
And uh, they brought her into the hospital. They transferred her over to Ronald Reagan in uh, the West L.A. And, uh, you know, after that, we traveled there to visit her there. And uh, when she was there, the doctor told her she has an enlarged heart. And she has this broken femur on her leg. And uh, she has one month to live. One month. The doctors at Ronald Reagan told her that she had one month to live. And I remember receiving that news from her mom and I remember rushing towards Ronald Reagan after hearing that news and going in at that night and obviously she was in that care mode so they didn't allow visitors but at that night they allowed her to come in and or allowed me to come in and as soon as I came in, she was the only one there without a mask. You know, obviously she was patient and they had all the COVID tests and all that. And as soon as I entered, I noticed something quickly and it was a smile on her face like that. She just had a smile. And I didn't want to mention or even discuss the sad news first, but she immediately talked about it first. She said, hey, uh, Pastor Nathan, thanks for coming in. By the way, I only have a month to live with a smile on her face. I'm like, I have no, this is the weirdest thing I've ever experienced, you know, in my hospital visitation life. And, uh, you know, I said, oh, okay. And she says, I'll be honest with you. I'm not scared. I'm not sad. I know God. I trust God. I trust in my Savior. And what a greater hope it is than to spend my life with Jesus with no pain. And she had so much joy. She was talking to me about one hour. And, you know, I remember, you know, what we talked about most times. She was giving me dating advice. That's what she was talking about. And she kept saying, you know, don't lead her on. You know, that's what she said. I don't think I really abided by that as much. But even though her doctor said she had a month to live, I remember our church, we all came to UCLA, and we started to pray for her outside. We couldn't enter because of COVID, and we were praying for her outside. And you know, we remember Vanessa, and uh, she was part of our announcement videos that we had, like the one you saw today. And, uh, you know, she still filmed an announcement video at the hospital, even though she had a month to live. But a month went by, and nothing happened. <laughs> Two months went by, and nothing happened. Three months came by and nothing happened. In fact, she was healing. Her leg was being healed. And the doctors just kept saying, you have one month to live every single month. And we're like, okay, what's going on here? I remember the next year as I was preaching and at the end of the service, as I, after I preached a message, and I see this woman coming in with Walker into the auditorium. And it was Vanessa after one year. She had hair again. They had to shave it off at the hospital. And she came back. And uh, she's still there right now. Alive. And guess what? She joined the praise team. She's up there singing. She's up there singing for God and saying, praise God. And she wants to do good. She wants to help people. She's always with a smile on her face. And she's going about welcoming new people. Going about saying, Pastor, is there anything else you need to help serve? Uh, and going to people and giving birthday gifts and cards and calling people and seeing where they are. She did good to her brothers and sisters at Hillcrest Baptist. Why? Because she had the love of Christ in her heart. And brothers and sisters, I pray that we would have that as well as a church. I pray that we would restore one another. I pray that we wouldn't judge one another. I pray that we would have a condescending attitude towards one another, but that we would love one another because we are walking in the Spirit. And yes, it may be hard. Yes, it may be difficult. There are days that you don't want to be spiritual. There are days you don't want to go to house church because of so-and-so. There are days you don't want to talk to that person because of so-and-so. Whatever reason. But Paul says, do not be wary. Don't be wary because one day... You're going to reap a harvest. One day you're going to see a blessing. One day there's going to be something amazing that comes from it. And so, brothers and sisters, today, as we think about together, we're not doing this just because of an event. We're doing this because that's what our mission is as a church, to be there for one another, to support one another, because we can't do it ourselves. Don't ever think that you're above sin, my friend. Don't ever think that you're above somebody else in the church. We're here for one another. we got to be there for one another. And so let's continue to grow together. 
Let's continue to be faithful in our house, church, and be more open, be more vulnerable, and let's also not judge one another and be there. And if somebody comes back into that door, let's welcome them with open arms, saying, thank you for coming back. Now let's get McDonald's. I pray that we will be that church, together in support. My time is up, so we're going to end the message right now. So let's have a word of prayer at this time.